Right, so thanks everybody for um, joining Magnets this week. We've had a little bit of a hiatus as we've had a break for um, other meetings that have been going on uh, through the course. Um, but it's good to, to, to be back again with a really nice, uh, a really nice turnout uh, this week. Um, for those who are new to the seminars, um, the seminars are about a, a, a 30 minute uh, presentation. So we kindly ask that you uh, keep your microphones muted. And if you're having problems with internet connection, you can turn off your uh, video connection. At the end, we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and discussions. Um, if you want to type your question into the chat, I'll happily uh, read it out for you. Uh, and as always, at the end, if anybody has some time to spare, uh, we've got an opportunity um, to catch up and uh, have just a bit of a, a social chat again and see how everybody's doing at the end of, of the seminar. Uh, so today, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have Tatiana uh, Serovskaya, uh, apologies if I don't quite get the name pronunciation correct, uh, from uh, GFC uh, Potsdam in Germany. And today um, they'll be talking about how we can extract uh, magnetic dipole field behavior from uh, beryllium isotopes. So I will hand over to you, Tatiana. Yeah, first of all, I would love to thank you for inviting me uh, to Magnet's uh, seminar and the opportunity to present my results. Uh, so today I will present the interpretation of cosmogenic beryllium 10 records in terms of um, geomagnetic field changes as well as environmental changes as a first step towards the integration of these records into the global geomagnetic field models. Um, before, um, before starting, I would love to acknowledge the contribution of my um, collaborators from GiftSet, uh, Monica Court and Sanya Panovska, from uh, IPGP, Jean-Pierre Vallée, and from Geosphere in Austria, Ramon Etli. So- uh, Sorry, Tatiana, yeah. is it possible to, to go into uh, full screen mode? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So as you know, there are two ways. Uh, allowing us to extract the geomagnetic field intensity from magnetization. The first relies on an uh, absolute pole intensity, uh, notably on um, lava rocks and archaeomagnetic samples. Yes, and uh, these techniques, um, yes, we can reproduce, um, we can make the experiment and obtain um, the value of ancient field in the lab. So unfortunately, uh, the volcanic eruptions are very punctual event and we cannot reconstruct the continuous um, geomagnetic field history yes, from the past. To overcome this problem, uh, we can turn to relative paleointensity that relies on continuous uh, deposition of uh, sediments in lake and in the, in the ocean. Uh, that contains uh, tiny magnetic particles recording, uh, recording the intensity and orientation uh, of the field. Um, yes, uh, despite the fact that, uh, that uh, we can reconstruct continuous uh, history from relative paleointensity, this technique has its own pitfalls. For example, um, yes, we assume that RPI is proportional to the natural remnant magnetization normalized by the stable remnant carrier in the rock. So this is the first challenge to properly isolate magnetic remnant carrier. So the second, uh, let's say, difficulty with RPI is the post depositional processes that can alter and corrupt our RPI record. And finally, we cannot just simply reproduce this process contrary to absolute pattern intensity in the laboratory condition due to the uh, time, uh, yes, due to the different timing that can take up to thousands of years, like to deposit our sediments on the ocean floor and so properly record the magnetic field. But uh, let's assume we are living in the ideal world. And uh, if we properly isolate our magnetic uh, carrier, we assume that RPI is proportional to the magnetic field intensity. So we know, and um, yes, we know that these two techniques have their drawbacks and advantages. And um, we can also appeal to alternative technique, which is not, um, which, is do which doesn't depend on uh, rock magnetization, but it depends on the concentration of cosmogenic isotopes in the sediments. So um, in my research, I mainly focused on cosmogenic isotope beryllium 10, 
which has a uh, long half decay life of 1.38 million years. So um, a bit of introduction in 1956, Walter El Elzasser came up with this empirical equation stating that the production of cosmogenic isotopes um, like is inversely proportional to the magnetic field moment. So how we measure and uh, yeah, where this beryllium came, comes from. Um, so let's assume that during the periods when geomagnetic field shielding um, is low, we would have um, like increased amount of galactic cosmic particles entering the atmosphere where um, they will encounter the isot uh, isotopes of oxygen, for example, and nitrogen. And due to this collision reaction, the atmospheric isotopes uh, would lose some protons and neutrons, and new so-called cosmogenic isotopes will be formed. Um, so based on the numerical simulations, uh, we can say that uh, around 65% um, of beryllium is formed in the stratosphere, where it resides one, two years. And uh, later on in the cascade reaction, around 35% of beryllium would be formed in the troposphere, where it resides around uh, several weeks. So it is assumed that uh, due to the atmospheric um, uh, homogenization, um, yes, and um, beryllium will be homogenized. And uh, yes, um, after, uh, afterwards, it will be deposited on the Earth's surface. Um, after being attached to the airborne particles with the precipitation, uh, with the rain and snow on the Earth's um, surface. So we, uh, in our research, we are mainly interested in the beryllium which enters the ocean, because first of all, uh, we can extract the long sedimentary cores and uh, trace uh, beryllium concentration changes um, um, back in time. So, and for example, we also the advantage of this technique that can uh, that we can take extract our long piston cores and compare beryllium concentration with relative pallium intensity. However, the difficulty here comes with again with normalization, because one cannot simply reconstruct uh, magnetic field changes based on beryllium ten only concentration within the sediments, because we know that some sediments that ha they they have higher potential in uh, beryllium ten scavenging. Uh, for example, clay that have a high specific surface area, in contrast to carbonate uh, that they are very poor beryllium scavengers. So, and when we uh, want to compare beryllium from different sites, we have to account this lithological inhomogeneities. Um, yeah, and uh, one of the very suitable candidate is um, stable isotope beryllium nine, um, which. Um, which has uh, similar uh, similar properties uh, as beryllium-10. Uh, and it is stable isotopes and uh, it's de de delivered to the ocean as a product of um, Earth's crust weathering and erosion. So uh, it's supposed that uh, both isotopes are carried uh, by the same carrier and this normalization, as you can see, it's kind of similar to relative paleointensity. So, which is proportional to um, field um, field intensity. So, however, also we should admit that beryllium ten and beryllium nine, as you can see, beryllium ten mainly enters from the atmosphere, whereas beryllium nine comes from the land. So, they have different uh, transport uh, sources and transport paths, which uh, might also introduce some kind of bias. But uh, yeah. So we assume that uh, this ratio is the best proxy to study the past geomagnetic field uh, changes. Well, on this graph, um, I would love to show you the results of numerical simulation showing the uh, relationship uh, between um, production rate of cosmogenic uh, beryllium-10 with magnetic dipole moment. Uh, showing that uh, the maximum of beryllium-10 uh, production is expected uh, during the low field, and also the relationship between production rate and the latitude, showing that the majority of beryllium is produced on the poles. So here on figure B, you see the 2D plot uh, showing the uh, polynomial relationship between global production rate and uh, geomagnetic field intensity for beryllium-10 and uh, chlorium-36. 
So on the figure C and D, I would love to show you previous attempt, um, attempts to convert um, billion 10 measure billion 10 into the VDM. So which is uh, very important for geomagnetic field studies. So um, on figure C, the authors, mini uh, collaborators in 2012, they performed the measurements in one core coming from um, Atlantic Ocean from Portuguese margin. And uh, so the let's say, approach was first normalize the measured uh, billion 10 uh, concentration. And then, um, so they try to assign the uh, absolute billion density value for uh, so the measured beryllium records. And after, so this uh, calibrated uh, beryllium, um, they try to yes, fit and obtain some relationship in, in order to convert the whole data set into the VDM. Well, the disadvantage of this technique is that this reconstruction and this calibration curve is based on the one location. And uh, we might assume that still beryllium is not totally free from environmental modulations. So on the figure G, two years uh, later, the same group of author, authors, they tried to again perform the calibration, but this time they use three different strategy, um, like of assigning uh, VADM, of assigning um, yeah, VADM to uh, beryllium in order to calibrate. So yes, again, this calibration curve that they obtained, like the main argument against this, that uh, this collaboration is based on the one site. Uh, this one was from uh, the Pacific Ocean. So the more advanced approach uh, came from the study of Simone et al. in 2016. And this time the, author, um, the authors, what they did, they made a stack of three West Pacific sites. So, and uh, they assumed that they, uh, let's say, average out um, yeah, some different uh, contributions related to zoology at each uh, record. But again, it stays, uh, it is a regional stack uh, ba based on the only West Pacific sites. And again, so here on the right, um, you see the plot uh, showing more or less the same strategy was uh, that was used by Minyabras and collaborators also tried to um, assign the um, absolute power intensity value to uh, osteogenic period stack uh, using uh, the value from different databases and for different uh, ages. So, and afterwards, they just tried to fit in order to fit uh, all these points in order to obtain the empirical calibration curve. So we can also uh, notice that this calibration curve is might be biased by the fact uh, that we have a, a lot of points corresponding to the strong field and only, let's say, several few points uh, corresponding to the weak field. And this relationship uh, seems to be hold only by this point. And if you continue this curve, it go ups again. So which is uh, not very realistic, but it, it's the best what have been done so far. Um, so um, on this slide, I would love to show you the figures from my collaborator from Sanya Panovska, made in 2019. And here we see the comparison of uh, billion 10 derived VDM uh, based on the algorithm of uh, Minyabras et al. and Simon et al. that we have just uh, seen on previous slides. And uh, this derived uh, uh, billion 10 derived VDM uh, are compared with a dipole moment obtained with a GGF100K model. So uh, yes, despite the fact that uh, this algorithm like of um, billion conversion in the VDM might, um, yeah, they, they might be not perfect, but still we see a global uh, good agreement during the um, yeah, overall production period of beryllium. And yes, um, last but not the least, I would love to show you the data which are currently used for uh, geomagnetic field models. Uh, it's mainly, it's not, it, it, it's the sediments. Uh, so relative pattern density converted to VADM and volcanic and archaeomagnetic data. And uh, here, so this uh, take home messages um, that we're still missing the beryllium that we would love to integrate in uh, global geomagnetic field models. But before doing this, uh, we um, and in this um, presentation, I would show you. I will show you how we normalize for non-geomagnetic contribution before integrating them into the magnetic field models. So to extract 
the geomagnetic field, um, let's say, signal from beryllium, uh, we were focused on um, four lone uh, beryllium ratios uh, records covering uh, the last 360,000 years. Uh, three records coming from West Pacific. Again, it's a cluster of West Pacific cores, but this time, these two cores we already studied, but Simon et al. and Newsom, he stuck. Here we added a new uh, cores that now we are preparing for publication. Also from West Pacific uh, core with uh, high, um, um, yes, uh, high resolution measurements. And uh, finally, we add one core from North Atlantic uh, Ocean, MD-95-2016. So uh, let's have a look at these uh, four records. So uh, blue, um, um, yeah, yellow and uh, red curves coming from West Pacific and we see that um, yeah, each core is, played, is plotted on the um, on its own H model, and we see the agreements of uh, peak uh, in beryllium ratio. And in contrast, we see that the black curve, uh, which is a record from North Atlantic, seems to have like totally different pattern, and it seems that it's dominated uh, by one hundred thousand uh, uh, years uh, cycles, so glacial intraglacial uh, variations. So we uh, attempt to um, understand what does it mean and how uh, bad it is. And as a first preliminary step, we compared our oxygenic uh, beryllium 10 um, ratio uh, with beryllium 9 um, with sea surface temperature, which was measured in uh, these two sites, in um, yeah, two West Pacific sites. Um, and um, for comparison with this record, uh, we produce the uh, average of uh, sea surface temperature measured in this course. So interestingly, what we notice that between like 2,000, 15,000 years and 350, we see the very good agreement between sea surface temperature and beryllium ratio. So those, this was surprising and it seems uh, like uh, this three West Pacific cores might be also environmentally dominated. Um, and we don't see the same say, behavior between zero and uh, 215,000 years. But in contrast, what we observe for North Atlantic site, it was a totally different story. It seems that um, beryllium um, ratio uh, mimics sea surface temperature variation, which doesn't make any sense uh, in, in terms of uh, geomagnetic field studies. So um, this was uh, our first concern. Um, and we wanted to see whether it's possible to rescue the oxygenic uh, beryllium ratio and extract uh, the geomagnetic signal in this high latitudinal site. Okay, let's have a look. So. Yeah, um, not being so uh, pessimistic, we decided to go with uh, principal component analysis in order to uh, distinguish geomagnetic uh, signal in this site from environmental variations. So um, for this, we uh, analyze a data set as it was composed of uh, beryllium uh, records of so beryllium 10, beryllium 9, and beryllium ratio. We also performed a bunch of measurements of um, elemental XRF ratios, like uh, calcium strontium, silicium strontium, and so on. We also included uh, the measurements of uh, delta oxygen 18 measured in planktonic foraminiferal species. And also for this analysis, uh, we included magnetic susceptibility and um, L uh, parameter showing the change of uh, color of sediments. So what we also noticed that with comparison of sea surface temperature, it was clear that the ratio is not uh, say usable for geomagnetic field reconstruction and it's dominated by 100,000 years. So we also analyzed the spectrums of beryllium 9 and beryllium 10 separately. And it seems that the ratio is dominated by beryllium 9 variation because this uh, peak is not, uh, yeah, it's, it's attenuated in beryllium 10 records. So maybe it's the first also hint that uh, these two beam isotopes, they have different transport paths and uh, we are dealing with or over normalization of beam 10 uh, record. And in this case, and in this location, beam 10 only works better as a ratio. So 
Yes, but um, yeah, let's have a look at the results with PCA. So for those who are not uh, familiar with this technique, uh, I prepared simple explication. So uh, let's uh, let's imagine we are in the concert in the concert hall or in the Philharmonie, and I'm sure that you have already noticed that on the scene we might have an instrument um, that I am in redundancy. So we have several guitars, several strings, and so on. So um, it is like our data set. So we have um, some environmental records which, which are in redundancy. And principal component analysis, the, its main aim is to reduce the uh, dimensionality of our data set by combining the original variants in the, uh, variables in the way uh, to increase uh, the variance and determine new and say principal components that will explain uh, in a more simple way um, our data set. So um, yeah, and these principal components are orthogonal and um, yeah, the orthogonal and not uh, uncorrelated, they are uncorrelated. Um, so mathematically it can be represented as um, performing the eigenvector uh, eigen decomposition of covariant matrix of our original variables. So uh, yes, this operation of rescuing our geomagnetic, um, beryllium geomagnetic record from this North Atlantic uh, site shows the following. The first principal component uh, explains uh, between like 43 and 47 percent of total uh, variance. The second component uh, explains uh, between um, 13 and 17 percent, and the third component explains between uh, nine and um, 13 percent of our global variance. So we didn't try to physically interpret each principal component because it might um, have no sense. We focused on the three first principal component and uh, tried to uh, figure out the physical, let's say, meaning. So the results of this um, extracted components and uh, conversion in the beryllium variation are presented in this, in this plot. Let's start from the panel uh, in the middle. So here um, you can see extracted uh, geomagnetic um, yeah, uh, geomagnetic variations of beryllium record compared with uh, um, stack of relative polyintensity curves since 2000. So you might see that mm, now it works. Uh, it, it worked not so bad. We see a good agreement uh, between um, during different excursions. For example, very good agreement during Norwegian uh, Greenland Sea excursion, post Blake Icelandic basin in terms of amplitude and the duration, as well as during uh, other excursions, but some intervals, um, yeah, we still see um, significant differences. So for example, La Chambre excursion seems to be absent in record um, from North Atlantic side, but it might also be related to the uncertainties in H model, or yeah, maybe this excursion was not like simply uh, registered by beryllium at this location. So second, we analyze the um, climatic variation um, uh, recorded in beryllium and compare them with um, benthic stack of oxygen, um, benthic uh, stack of oxygen records LR04. So yes, uh, you can see that um, yeah, two curves um, yeah, showing similar um, yeah, variations. So just also to explain what means this gray curves. So this uh, thick um, or dark uh, gray curves, uh, it's a realization of principal component analysis when uh, beryllium uh, record uh, was mm, like we didn't assign any error to beryllium record and uh, this um, gray curves corresponding to uh, 100 realization of PCA when each time uh, beryllium record was corrupted with uh, creating uncer created uncertainty. So, and finally, the beryllium PC3 based um, curve um, record shows the similarity between um, 200,000 years and 600,000 years with the sea surface temperature measured in 982. So this was our interpretation of the three uh, first principal components. 
Um, well, it was um, it was nice to compare it with uh, like global um, paleomagnetic curve, but it was also for us interesting to see how um, close or how similar um, recovered um, geomagnetic beryllium variations um, to um, concentration of beryllium uh, measured in uh, North Atlantic uh, sites. So. Um, in 2010, uh, Crystal and collaborator performed principal component analysis on uh, these three uh, Atlantic records. So the PCA was based not only not uh, on uh, uh, let's say uh, magnetic field proxies and environmental proxies, but only on these three curves. So uh, the principal component, let's say geom uh, geomagnetic beryllium, are traced here as a, a blue curve and compared with our uh, reconstruction. So we can see that, uh, yes, some excursions are, yeah, they have a very good uh, accord, um, um, resemblance uh, between uh, these two ones, especially um, Atlantic Basin and uh, Norwegian Greenland. But again, uh, there is something happening during the Lachon. So maybe also if we compare our reconstruction with individually uh, measured beryllium 10 concentration in these three sites, we see that interestingly that our beryllium is, um, um, is very well agreed with one core from South Atlantic and both curves plotted on their own um, age uh, depth um, yeah, models agree um, during this beryllium overproduction around 30,000 uh, years. And the duration of the Icelandic basin excursion seems to be also coherent, whereas comparison with uh, North Atlantic record, uh, which is um, uh, yeah was sampled in the vicinity from our studied site, seems to have an offset again uh, due, during the Lachon, and the duration of Icelandic basin excursion is very different, uh, yeah, based on these two sites. So yes, anyways, um, it was um, interesting to say analyze it in terms of global um, yeah, variation and the local ones. So uh, now we assume that we made a not so bad job. So if we compare initially beryllium ratio with our extracted uh, geomagnetic beryllium variation, it seems that it uh, works much better than, uh, yeah, than the ratio. Even though uh, we see that some peaks um, yeah, they're not uh, very good aligned with Pacific records, but still, uh, yeah, we see a better coherence between the records. So this time also to just compare, I run uh, several PCA on data on four data set. So the data set was composed on four billion ratios, four RPI records, four billion nine records, and four billion ten records. And this graph just to show you that. Interestingly, so um, contrary to this assumption that beryllium ratio should be proportional and should be the best proxy to study the geomagnetic field variations, we see that uh, the first principal component of beryllium 10 um, data set explain the higher variance in comparison of beryllium. So it means that uh, these beryllium records from Pacific and from North Atlantic side, they share, um, say, um, yeah, they share the, the common uh, signal in comparison with beryllium ratio. So in addition to PCA, we also try to extract a um, global geomagnetic component with another technique, which is called independent component analysis. So yes, again, very rudimental and simple explanation how it works. Works. Uh, let's imagine that now we are not in a big uh, scene, but we are in small. In, we, we are in a small jazz club and in small scene. So we, let's assume we have just three musical instruments, and um, yeah, uh, which we'll call as yeah as um, yeah. Then and this scene would have uh, three different micros that uh, would try to record every uh, each musician. But because uh, our scene is so small and the distance between the musical instrument is not so large, each micro will record not only one, say contrabass or saxo or whatever, it will record the mixture of these three instruments. So um, let's imagine that our, my, that our recorded signal is our entry signal, 
uh, multiplied by the mixing matrix. So what does ICA? It search for this unmixing matrix in order to decompose a uh, data set of our original variables into the data set of uh, maximum uh, different signals based on their, um, uh, yeah, uh, based on their um, non-Gaussianity. So the ICA will be looking uh, either like uh, on the Krutolis parameter or the gentropy, which is a measure how, um, is it, which is a measure of distance of our records from uh, Gaussian, uh, uh, from Gaussian signals or from, yeah, signals with normal distribution. So the biggest difference also uh, between ICA and PCA that uh, while PCA assumes that our records are Gaussian, ICA assumes that our records are non Gaussian. So, and for us, it was very interesting to test whether we obtain different results because, uh, yeah, with these two different approaches. Well, uh, here are the results um, of extracted geomagnetic component with two methods with principal component analysis and uh, independent component analysis. And uh, the difference between uh, panel A and B is that uh, in panel A, it's uh, extracted geomagnetic component from beryllium ratios. And on figure uh, B, it's uh, extracted component from B10, uh, only not normalized by beryllium 9. So what can we learn from these results? So first of all, interestingly, and uh, yeah, it was a good uh, result that our PCA and ICA agrees uh, pretty well. So it also gives us uh, an idea how stable our methods, so they uh, yeah, work pretty well. And um, yeah, we compare uh, obtained results again with SINT, with the global curve. And yes, now we see that, uh, okay, our Lachamp uh, agrees pretty well, as well as other excursion, but here also we see a very big misfit. So, but very interestingly that um, um, the correlation strengths between um, geomagnetic uh, beryllium 10 variations with uh, PCA and with ICA seems to be uh, higher for beryllium 10 only in comparison with beryllium ratio. So again, maybe it's a hint that uh, beryllium 9 records uh, are not, uh, let's say, ideal normalizator, and sometimes beryllium 10 can even uh, perform a better job than the ratio. So secondly, we also succeeded to extract the climatic component, and in contrast to um, um, site MD95-2016 from North Atlantic, we see that our records, especially uh, beryllium ratio uh, climatic component, um, dominated by 23,000 years periodicity and uh, yeah, seems to share similar frequency with the Earth's precision. So um, if you analyze the climatic component from um, beryllium 10, we see that it's not as obvious as uh, beryllium ratio. And again, so we suspect that this periodicity might come from maybe original modulation of uh, beryllium 9 record. So the take home message that we should be very careful when we try like simply convert to this beer ratio because sometimes beer 10 can uh, be uh, more reliable. Yeah. So now let's have a look at uh, the continuous wavelength transforms. So the CVT or continuous wavelength transform. Um, so it's a tool for investigating time variant spectrum characteristic of non-stationary uh, um, uh, signals. So here you see this transform made for the magnetic component and for cl climate component. So uh, let's start from PCA and ICA um, beryllium, geomagnetic beryllium variations. So we see that uh, in addition to 100,000 years periodicity, we see the strong uh, dominance from like precision uh, band or from 23,000 years uh, seen on both reconstruction with ICA and with PCA. Interestingly, if we analyze the spectrum of period 10 only, not normalized by nine, we see that um, yeah, they are mainly dominated by uh, glacial, interglacial cycles, cycles uh, and not uh, by the precision. 
And also, uh, it was uh, very interesting to check uh, the SINT 2000 record, and it seems that it's uh, also, uh, yeah, it's also preserved uh, this 100,000 years periodicity. So on the question whether this periodicity is um, characteristic for geomagnetic field variation or it's just uncompensated uh, climatic component. Yeah, that was failed to compensate with uh, normalizer. So, and the lower uh, line, is a yeah wavelets uh, for climatic component. Here we see that um, yeah PCA uh, based uh, climatic beam ratio uh, has twenty three and forty one thousand years periodicity, uh, which is more strongly pronounced in uh, PCA reconstruction in comparison with ICA. And uh, yeah, beryllium ten seems to be dominated by twenty three thousand years periodicity, similar to precision. And finally, so we're approaching maybe the main objective of our work is um, yeah, reconstruct uh, the VDM based on this uh, clean beryllium uh, record that was, yeah, that was uh, separated for geomagnetic variation and climate variation. So here on the uh, left, you see the panel showing the relationship between uh, geomagnetic, um, reconstructed geomagnetic beryllium variation as a function of geomagnetic field intensity. So here we assume that um, the production of cosmogenic uh, beryllium normalized by the present, um, uh, the, the, the value of the present field is a function of uh, magnetic uh, field moment normalized by um, the modern value. So um, the challenge was to find this uh, Q function, which uh, we obtain uh, as the best fit of beryllium production to the data uh, that was already presented by uh, Minya Bras, Asim Kantan, and based on numerical uh, simulation of Masaryk and Beer in 2009. And uh, this uh, yeah, function is described here. So, so the last step was to convert our geomagnetic uh, beryllium component into the VEDM, uh, which we compare here again on the SINT record. Um, yeah. So uh, what have we uh, seen today? What have we learned? So uh, the joint pca ICA approach was used uh, for the first time for paleomagnetic variation reconstruction. So it seems that uh, climatic component of cosmogenic beryllium shares a similar frequency with the Earth's precision. Um, and geomagnetic component still like kept uh, this 100,000 years periodicity. So we also seen that the global beryllium 10 geomagnetic component obtained with both techniques with PCA and ICA display a strong agreement with composite curve of relative by intensity uh, since 2000, despite okay, several disagreements. And also we have seen with all this analysis that beryllium 10 geomagnetic component seems to be less impacted by the local environment effects in comparison with beryllium ratio. So I will finish at this slide and uh, will be happy to answer your question if you have any. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tatiana. That was a, a really interesting talk. I think we can all uh, give Tatiana a, a virtual round of applause um, for for um, yeah quite an in depth interesting a lot of interesting things in there. Um, we can open up the floor uh, to to uh, questions. Um, so please uh, raise your hand and we'll ask you to unmute if you have any questions. Well, I'll 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 kick off. Um, with some questions, what people are, are, are thinking. So, uh, I, I guess your ultimate kind of aim is to be able to, um, you know, bolster up some of the VADM records that we can uh, feed into to global field models. Um, you know, what kind of potential is there for filling in um, the sort of geographical and temporal distribution, the gaps that we have, particularly in uh, areas in, 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 in the southern hemisphere and, and oceans that are, are poorly represented. You know, what's the potential of filling in some of these gaps with um, beryllium records? Uh, well, the problem is that um, because we might still have some non-geomagnetic contribution, you know, uh, I think it's 
uh, it is challenging to fill the gap in terms of spatial distribution, you know, just to, okay, got some beryllium records from the places where there's no RPI, because here even like the idea is to extract the global component. Mm. So it's complicated to fill the gap, as you say, because also when we, I mean, it's common to get both uh, relative pollen intensity and beryllium records also. So normally they come in pair because, uh, okay, some, like there's a mission and we already got enough material, you know, to measure two of them. And unfortunately, I think it's complicated to yeah, resolve solve this problem of a geographical, say, a special distribution of paleomagnetic records. Uh, so we've got um, one question in the 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 uh, in the chat from uh, Romina Akaka. I apologize if I don't pronounce that correct. Um, so thank you for, uh, so much for your talk, Tatiana. Uh, your work is very interesting. Uh, do you know if there is any similar work focused on the Holocene? Uh, I'd like to compare uh, with my RPI records. Uh, well, the yeah, there was study in North Atlantics, but not as detailed as uh, yes, these records. And to my knowledge, there is no detailed, uh, unfortunately, no detailed beryllium records. But some people measured beryllium in lakes. I'm not an expert because I'm more focused on uh, oceanic uh, beryllium records. So I cannot really advise the study for the Holocene. Yeah, because we are also aiming the longer time scale since, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Kathy Constable has, your, have, has a hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks for a great talk, Tatiana. I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, I was looking at your uh, disagreement with SINT 2000 in the sort of 300 to 400,000 year interval. And that actually turns out to be a region in which uh, SINT 2000 and the reconstruction of Padam 2M don't quite agree. And uh, that might actually make for some difference in uh, your reconstruction or better agreement with your reconstruction. So I was wondering if that might be worth looking at. Mm. Yeah, I didn't check that, but uh, yeah. Definitely since uh, it's not also 100% free of like my, from some environmental, <laughs> Uh, none, of, not, none of these records are, yeah. and uh, I would, you know, but uh, the, the PADM 2M is based on uh, con considerably more records, so maybe it's a more global representation than the SINT yeah. record could be thought of as. Just anyway, might be worth a look. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. I, I didn't have a look, even though we discussed it with uh, Sani and Monica, but I still didn't uh, check the PDM and uh, these reconstructions. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we've got another uh, question in the chat from Agatha Olivi. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, if I got it well, the uh, beryllium nine is not as constant as we thought, making the the ten to nine ratio not the uh, not that efficient in some settings. Uh, what would be your hypothesis regarding these variations in beryllium nine? Is it different scavenging effic efficiency, uh, different weathering variations? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this uh, question. A very good one. Um, well, we would suggest that the problem that, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, that these two isotopes might be, like they have different transport paths. So, and it might not be accounted. So, although the scavenging or the efficiency should be same for these two isotopes, the transport path might be different. So this might be, yeah, the, the main problem, for example, when I analyzed in detail, but I didn't present it in this talk, the beryllium nine uh, variations and beryllium 10, uh, we clearly see that uh, beryllium nine was um, dominated by um, ice melting fluxes. So whereas beryllium 10, which comes mainly from the atmosphere, not from the land, didn't show the same pattern. So this, let's say, ice melting fluxes, which also was um, noticed for Buffin Bay records, uh, 
yeah, it's simply like contained in Birium 9 and not Birium 10. And uh, by normalizing, we might introduce this pattern to Birium 10. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more quick question if anybody wants to throw one out. I kind of have one following on from that if nobody else wants to ask another. Um, so I just just following on from that point when you were saying that you know the, the, the beryllium nine is concentration maybe um, related to to ice melt fluxes. I, I guess that means that it is potentially quite locally variable, right? So that that you know exactly where you are with respect mm -hmm. to, to different um, terrestrial sources, um, the efficiency of 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 um, beryllium nine scavenging is quite quite locally dependent is that right no the scavenging itself the potential oh. itself is uh say same but yeah but the, the it's, it's a local right yes it's mm. a local effect and that was the idea to study locally distributed cores so in order to see whether this let's say particular regional effects can be compensated by looking for the let's say uh, the common signal and which we don't want to have in our beryllium. So, and also this analysis might show that uh, maybe it can be also be dangerous to study like a simple beryllium uh, core and uh, converting it to VADM. So yes, it's also a take home message that we should study as similar to relative body density. So yeah, as better we, it's, it's like the more we have, the better it is, yeah. So one last, one last quick question from the from the chat again from uh, Romina. Are there any other uh, radionuclide records such as carbon fourteen that you can add to to sort of supplement your study? Uh, well, the problem of um, is half decay life of carbon fourteen and barium ten. So again, we are aiming and we are looking for longer time scales, and for uh, like carbon fourteen will we can cover housing records and cannot go further, unfortunately, but yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I think we can give uh, Tatiana another another round of applause for um, uh, an excellent uh, presentation and a nice bit of, of science. Um, just before um, we all uh, disappear for the evening or the afternoon, I just want to thank everybody again for, for, for uh, coming coming uh, this week. It's been a, another great turnout. Um, we are, Magnus is back in a couple of weeks with uh, uh, Pablo Perez from, from Spain. He'll be giving a, a presentation. We have a, a short break uh, coinciding with the uh, IUGG meeting, uh, and then we will be back uh, in late July, early August uh, with another uh, round of, of seminars. Uh, but as always, um, all our seminars are available uh, on YouTube to catch up um, later on. But just thanks, everybody, for, for uh, supporting Magnets, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Thank you very much.